You're listening to the Inside Out Podcast, a Cracked Rackets and Tennis Channel Podcast Network production and powered by Midwest Sports. The purpose of this series is to determine the best American male tennis player at any given point in the open era. To signify which American male sat on top of the American men's tennis world, we award them the hypothetical championship belt. Here's the criteria I used in judging each of these players. Grand Slam titles, year-end rankings, popularity amongst fans, Davis Cup success, success on the American Junior Tour, and last but not least, head-to-head records. In 1995, Nike created an advertisement to celebrate the Pete Sampras-Andre Agassi rivalry. In what is still one of the strangest television commercials I have ever seen, the two American men race around New York City in a taxi, stopping to create a tennis court and to play a match in the streets. This may seem like an irrelevant detail. However, in my 24 years of life, I have still never seen a tennis commercial so prominently feature two American male players. The commercial's existence speaks to the extent to which the Pete Sampras Andre Agassi rivalry transcended not only American tennis, but American sports culture as well. Part 5, and then there were two Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi. Sampras, Agassi, Courier, and Chang combined to win 27 of the 56 Grand Slam singles events held between Chang's 1989 French Open title and Agassi's 2003 Australian Open title. That means four American men combined to win 48% of the Grand Slam singles events played in that stretch of time. Additionally, One of these four players won two or more single slams in six separate seasons during the 1990s. That feat remains unmatched by any other generation of American men. Through the 1992 season, each of Sampras, Agassi, Courier, and Chang had showed that they could dominate the tour at any given tournament. However, neither Courier nor Chang managed to eclipse the accomplishments of their earliest seasons. Thankfully, Given the rise of Sampras and Agassi, their respective declines did little to diminish the standing of American tennis. At the start of the 93 Wimbledon, Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi began separating themselves from their competitors. The two combined to win 20 of the next 39 men's single slams. Polar opposites in both game style and personality, their rivalry filled a void in tennis left open since the days of McEnroe vs. Connors. The two were undisputably the best players in men's tennis. As such, the quality of their play treated American fans to a level of tennis that they had never seen before, and one that has not been achieved by any American man since. On April 12, 1993, Pete Sampras became the top-ranked player in the world. He earned this feat despite not having won a slam since the 1990 U.S. Open. Afterwards, he received criticism from both fans and media alike. To them, players like Courier, Becker, and Edberg deserved the top ranking, as they had won slams quite recently. Sampras's performance at the 1993 French Open only served to legitimize those claims. The top-seeded Sampras fell in the quarterfinal round, while contemporary Jim Courier proceeded to another slam final. The criticism continued to mount through the grass court summer and reached its peak as Wimbledon began. Here, however, Sampras' narrative began its turn. Only the fourth time in 46 years, an All-American final. In 93, 
Pete walked onto the Wimbledon grass with a new attitude. He was pitted against Courier in the final. There was no more nonchalance. He was very much all business. Pete conquered Wimbledon. And here's the champion, Pete Sampras. One must wonder how many more times might we see this scene. At the 1993 Wimbledon, Sampras dispatched Agassi, Becker, and Courier to capture his second Grand Slam title. He quickly followed that up with a dominant performance at the U.S. Open, dropping only two sets en route to his third ever Grand Slam victory. He made it three in a row with his 94 Australian Open title, and after falling in the French Open quarters, he made it four out of five by defending his crown at Wimbledon. It's worth looking at just how exceptional Pete Sampras was from 1993 to 1997. Over the course of those five seasons, Sampras averaged a record of 71 and 13 in tour-level events. Playing about 19 events per season, Sampras won an average of 8 events and reached a total of 9.4 finals per season over that stretch of time. That translates to him winning 40% of the events he plays and reaching the final in almost half of them. He won 9 major titles, reached an additional major final in 20 slams, and won 8 Masters title in 33 events. He also finished the 94, 96, 97 seasons as the year-end champion and ended every season during the stretch ranked number 1. Sampras' 1994 season particularly stands out as one of the greatest in the sport's history. In 18 events, he reached 12 finals, won 10 titles including crowns at the Australian Open and Wimbledon, took home the year-end championships, and went a total of 77-12 and 12 to end the year ranked as the number one player. Sampras' biggest blemish of the year came at the U.S. Open, where he was upset in the fourth round. Surprisingly, that was not the biggest storyline coming out of the event. Instead, everyone was talking about how one player became the first unseeded men's singles champion in the tournament's history. That player, of course, was Andre Agassi. The full account of Agassi's story is best given in his autobiography, Open. He describes at length the degree to which he suffered from both physical and mental ailments throughout his career. Beyond the injuries and drug use, Agassi also claims to have hated playing the sport on multiple occasions. Nevertheless, his talent was undeniable. He first cracked the top 100 in October of 1986. Unlike his contemporaries, he was able to skip the 1987 Kalamazoo having already secured direct entry into the U.S. Open. He was the first out of all of us to make the first break. I mean, he, you know, went on to win like five tournaments of one year, and he got into the top five, and he really kind of was the, the start of the American crew. He was the man. I mean, he was definitely the, the first guy to, to, to make that first jump. Perhaps the most impressive aspect of Agassi's career was its longevity. He first reached the top ten in June of 1988, and is one of the few players in men's tennis history to have a top 10 ranking in three separate decades. He is also the only player in tennis history to have won the career Super Slam, meaning he won each major in Olympic singles gold and the ATP year-end championships at least one time during his career. Agassi was actually the last of the Golden Generation to win a slam, and in 1997, he became the first of the four to fall out of the top 100. Injuries, a flunk drug test, and incredibly poor match results plagued his 1997 season. After reaching as high as number one in the world in 1995, it seemed like Agassi had finally burnt out for good. Perhaps that is why, upon reflection, his career is the most fascinating of the four players. Agassi made four straight slam finals between the 99 and 2000 seasons and won five more slams between 1999 and 2003. He finished his career with eight major titles in all, 
and was ranked number one in the world as late as August 2003. In 2006, he sailed off into the sunset, becoming the last of the golden generation to retire from the tour. Over the last 21 years, I have found you, and I will take you and the memory of you with me for the rest of my life. Thank you. And there's no doubt that the flamboyant personality Agassi displayed on the court has helped him achieve all of the success in his post-tennis career. The next chapter of Andre's story uh, needed to be written, and I was one of somebody who, who took his caring and, and put it into action, and, and you could walk through those doors now. That, that particular passion and dream actually has a lock and key. You open it up, walk in there, you see the school, the classrooms, and, and, it's, and there it is. His charity, the Andre Agassi Charitable Foundation in Southern Nevada, has raised over $60 million for at-risk children. In 2001, the foundation opened the Andre Agassi College Preparatory Academy in Vegas, a K-12 public charter school for at-risk children. He also dated Barbara Streisand and Brooke Shields before settling down and marrying fellow tennis star Steffi Graf in 2001. Starting with a five-set Sampras victory in the 93 Wimbledon quarterfinals, results from the Agassi-Sampras rivalry defined the storylines on the ATP Tour. The guys won seven of the eight majors from Wimbledon 93 to Australia 95. They flip-flopped between the number one and two spots in the rankings on multiple occasions and played in 16 finals against one another during their respective careers. It's also worth examining just how dominant the two were against their fellow American contemporaries. Sampras carried a winning record against every American he faced during this era, going 16-4 against Jim Courier, 12-8 against Michael Chang, 18-4 against Todd Martin, 7-0 against Mal Washington, 8-0 against David Wheaton, 6-2 6-2 and two against Richie Reneberg, and 4-1 and one against young upcomer Vincent Spadia. Outside of his head-to-heads with Sampras and Courier, Agassi went 15-7 and seven against Chang, 13-5 and five against Martin, 6-2 and two against Washington, 6-3 and three against Wheaton, 9-0 and oh against Reneberg, 4-2 and two against Vincent Spadia, and 5-1 and one against Andy Roddick. The biggest difference between Agassi and Sampras is that while Agassi fell off from 1996 to 1999, Sampras solidified his claim as one of, if not the greatest, male tennis player of all time. He won 7 of 8 Wimbledons from 93 to 2000 and ended the millennium with the most Grand Slam titles of any man in the Open era. Agassi deserves mountains of credit for his late career resurgence, and that resurgence is certainly enough to get him in the best male tennis player of all time conversation. However, by the end of his career, Pete Sampras' place in tennis history was already secured. No result better epitomizes Sampras' edge over Agassi than the final match of their career which took place during the 2002 U.S. Open Men's Singles Final. Despite coming into the event as the lower-seeded player, Sampras knocked off seeds Greg Rosinski, Tommy Haas, Andy Roddick, and Sung Shalkin before meeting up with the six-seeded Agassi. Over the course of his four-set victory, Sampras' serve-and-volley tactics and relentless aggression under pressure got him over the edge against Agassi one last time and secured his final Grand Slam victory. He's there. He's champion for the fifth time here in New York. And he's made monkeys out of most of us. It should come as no surprise that Sampras carried a 20-14 career head-to-head edge over Agassi, which includes a 4-1 record in slam finals. By the time Sampras defeated Agassi in that U.S. Open final, the duo's narrative was already written. Despite all of Agassi's charisma and talent, both on and off the court, Sampras was, and may still be, the king of American men's tennis.
There's no denying the two took American men's tennis to places it had never seen before. Their rivalry defined a generation of American men's tennis, a generation that was the best our country has ever seen. We hope you enjoyed listening to part five of our series, The Belt. Before we go, we have to give a shout out to a couple of people who helped make these episodes possible. A big thank you to Blue Claw Music and Thomas Ackley for their song, America the Beautiful, Hip Hop Track Remix, which you will hear used throughout this series. We also want to give a shout out to Tennis Famer, Takezo Bomblat, Tennis Channel, and Fox Sports for their help in the clips we use throughout this. As always, Shout out to super producer Daniel Westoff for the f*** of an editing job he has done throughout this series. Coming up in our next episode, as American tennis fans, we reached the peak of the summit with Andre Agassi and Pete Sampras. The biggest question, where could we go from there? We try to answer that in our next episode as we explore the career of Andy Roddick.